To a lot of people, man's best friend, the dog, is likely to be the perfect pet. Often noisy and sometimes obedient, but always loyal, our four-legged friends often become the focus in many people's lives. Tens of thousands of us prefer the quieter company of a cat, while the more affluent may aspire to the 17-handed variety of animal. But what about the person wishing to pursue an interest in the not-so-normal, the animal lover who doesn't want a soft coat to stroke or an early morning gallop? Nowadays, many people are discovering the fascinating world of keeping lizards in captivity. It can be one of the most rewarding hobbies, but it can also be one of the most frustrating. The secret to success lies in choosing the correct type of lizard in the first place and understanding its requirements. In this video, we're going to show you how to achieve these objectives and how to avoid some of the more common mistakes. Because lizards aren't like other pets, we need to understand just what makes them tick before we can give them the conditions they need. So before we go any further, there are a few points we need to look at. The most important of these concern the way in which lizards regulate their body temperature, their social behaviour and also the way in which they absorb calcium into their bodies. Lizards are reptiles and like other reptiles they rely on outside sources of heat to keep their bodies at a suitable temperature. Each species differs slightly in its ideal temperature, but generally speaking, lizards function best at temperatures between about 25 and 40 degrees Celsius. In the wild, lizards can increase their body temperatures by basking in the sun or by pressing themselves against a warm object, such as a rock. When the temperature drops, they hide away and become inactive. In captivity, then, it's important to give lizards two things, an opportunity to warm themselves to their preferred temperature and a temperature cycle so that they can have a period of rest as well as a period of activity. Later in this video, we'll show you the correct methods of giving them these conditions. Many male lizards and some females are territorial by nature. This means that they won't tolerate other lizards inside their living space. If you want to keep a group of lizards together, it's important to avoid keeping more than one male in the cage. You might also run into trouble if you try to keep too many lizards together, even if they're females. When lizards become overcrowded, some of them, usually the smaller ones, will hide away for much of the time and will not have an opportunity to feed. Their colours will fade and if you don't separate them from their more dominant cage mates, they'll eventually die. You can avoid some of these problems by keeping small groups, say one male, and one to three females together, and by making sure that there are plenty of hiding places so that each lizard can have somewhere to lurk when it needs some peace. When you feed the lizards, make sure that they all come out to eat and that the larger ones don't bully the smaller ones. If bullying does take place, the only answer is to set up another cage and divide them into smaller groups or even to house them individually for a while. Some lizards can't make their own vitamin D from their food. They need sunlight or a suitable substitute. Without vitamin D, they can't absorb calcium into their bodies. And so, even if there is plenty of calcium in their diet, their bones won't form properly and any number of other problems may arise. You can easily provide extra calcium by using one of the dietary supplements that have been designed for reptiles. But providing the right amount of vitamin D can be more difficult. One method is to use special lights that give out ultraviolet light. This is the part of the spectrum that the lizards need to make vitamin D, and these lights should be available from your reptile supplier. The other method is to sprinkle a vitamin supplement over their food. Unfortunately, because each species seems to need a slightly different amount of vitamin D, some trial and error may be necessary. What suits one lizard won't necessarily suit them all. We'll be discussing lighting and vitamin supplements in more detail later. There are nearly 4,000 species of lizard found throughout the world, but only a few of these are suitable for keeping in captivity. Some are too large or too small. Many are very rare and aren't available to the pet trade. Others eat food that's hard to come by, or they may be difficult to keep for reasons that aren't yet clear to us. Beginners are advised to choose from a fairly limited range of species, 
all of which fare well under quite basic conditions. Species that you should consider include the leopard gecko, which originates from the deserts of Central Asia, anolis lizards, most of which hail from Florida and the Caribbean, the bearded dragon from the drier regions of Australia, and blue-tongued skinks, also found in Australia as well as New Guinea. Other species that can be recommended, but which are slightly more demanding, include the green iguana from the forests of South and Central America, plumed basilisks, which are also from the same region, water dragons from the forests of Southeast Asia, and the veiled chameleon from parts of the Middle East. Wherever possible, try to insist on captive bred lizards. This shouldn't be a problem with leopard geckos, bearded dragons, basilisks, water dragons, blue-tongued skinks and veiled chameleons. Green iguanas are captive farmed in parts of Central America and this is a better alternative to wild caught ones. Whenever possible, buy young lizards because they'll adapt better to captivity than adults. Beginners should avoid buying species that get too large. These include monitor lizards and tegus, which can reach sizes of over one metre. Other species that are sometimes offered for sale, but which require specialised knowledge, include chameleons, other than the veiled chameleon, larva lizards, large wild-caught water dragons, iguanas and similar species. Never buy a lizard without knowing what its requirements are, as there are many on the market that are almost impossible to keep alive for any length of time. Once you've decided which species you want to keep, you'll have the task of finding someone who has some for sale. Local pet shops and some of the better garden centres are the obvious choice for most people. There you go. That's a, a nice male leopard. And provided they can offer good advice and are also able to supply you with the equipment and food that your lizard will need, you may not need to look any further. Specialist reptile dealers are also likely to have a wide range of species on offer. They'll also have a variety of food, reference books and accessories. Once you've decided on the type of lizard you want to buy, you'll need to consider the different cage designs in which lizards can be kept. Some are more suitable for certain species than others. If you intend to put your lizards on display, in the living room for instance, you'll want to invest in an attractive cage with a glass front. You can either adapt to this from an aquarium using one of the vivarium lid conversions that are on the market, or you can use a wooden cage with a sliding glass front. These cages are available from reptile supply shops, or if you're more adventurous, you could make one of your own. Either way, make sure that your cage is large enough, and in particular, make sure there's room to fit lights in the top. Remember that some lizards require a humid environment, and plastic-faced chipboard doesn't last long under these conditions, unless edges are properly sealed. Leopard geckos, bearded dragons and similar species, however, which require a dry environment, will happily live in this type of cage. Other types of cages, less suitable for display but useful for some lizards, include plastic food storage boxes, which are available in a range of sizes. Some have clear sides, so the lizards can be seen easily, whereas others are more opaque, giving them a degree of privacy. Small plastic lunch boxes are especially useful for raising small baby lizards, such as hatchling leopard geckos. One of the most important things to consider when keeping lizards is the size of the cage. Factors to bear in mind are the size of the lizard, how many you intend keeping together, and how active they are. As a guide, a pair of bearded dragons need a cage with one to two square meters of floor space. Veiled chameleons need a cage at least a meter high so that they can climb. Some small lizards, of course, need much less space. A pair of leopard geckos, for instance, will live happily in a cage measuring about 60 by 30 by 30 centimetres. And three or four anolis need a tall cage measuring about 60 centimetres in each direction. At the other extreme, one or two baby iguanas would need a cage measuring not less than one metre by 50 centimetres deep and at least 50 centimetres high. And as they grow, they'll need to be given even more space. Large adults will be cramped in a cage measuring anything less than two metres in every direction. Don't buy lizards of this type unless you know that you'll be able to accommodate them when they grow up. Many people give their large lizards the run of a conservatory or a room in the house, but you might have problems trying to house train them.
Regardless of which type of cage you choose, the environment inside it must be suitable for the lizard species you want to keep. The environment includes heating, lighting and humidity and you'll need to take all of this into account when buying and setting up cages and equipment. Let's look at these points one at a time. As we saw at the start of this video, lizards aren't able to generate body heat internally and so they have to rely on outside sources. Most lizards prefer a body temperature of 30 to 40 degrees Celsius and so you must provide some means of heating their cage. Cage heating comes in two basic forms. Firstly, you can apply heat to the floor of the cage using a heat pad. These items give out a gentle heat over a wide area. The power of the pad depends on its size. The other method is to use a heater that will throw the heat down into the cage. Heaters of this sort include ceramic bulbs and trough heaters, ordinary domestic light bulbs and spotlights. The method you choose will depend, to a certain extent, on the species of lizard you want to keep. Leopard geckos, for instance, are naturally active at night, and so they're used to taking their heat from the ground. They'll be happy with just a heat pad placed under or in their cage. Iguanas and bearded dragons, on the other hand, are active by day and like to bask. They'll need a heater such as a spotlight that's mounted above them and which radiates heat downwards. If you place a flat rock or a thick log under the spotlight, this will become the basking area and allow the lizards to get as close to the heat as they want to. The temperature directly under the spotlight should be about 40 degrees Celsius. Iguanas, bearded dragons and other day active lizards, however, should not be allowed to bask for 24 hours every day because this is unnatural. So you should turn their spotlights off at night, perhaps by connecting them to a time switch. To prevent the temperature falling too much, their cage can also have a heat pad, and this will maintain a steady background temperature throughout the night. As a rule, all lizard cages should have a heat pad installed. Its area should be less than one half of the floor area, and you should leave it on all the time. Some makers advise using a thermostat, but others can be plugged directly into the mains. But always remember to follow the directions that come with the equipment. In addition, lizards that like to bask Iguanas, bearded dragons, day geckos, some skinks, anolis lizards and similar species need a spotlight as well. One golden rule that you should bear in mind when you install your heating is to direct the heat to one end of the cage only. This is because nobody knows exactly what temperature lizards need every minute of the day and night. If you make the whole cage the same temperature and that temperature happens to be the wrong one, the lizards will suffer. By placing the heaters at one end, you'll create a thermal gradient and the lizards will be able to move about in the cage, finding the place that suits them best at any given time. Basking lizards in particular will often sit under a spotlight for a few minutes to warm themselves up and then move to a cooler part of the cage to feed or rest. Besides heating, most lizards need some form of lighting, so you can give them a natural day and night cycle. If you use spotlights to heat your lizards, this may give sufficient light, but large cages also require additional lights in the form of fluorescent tubes attached to the top. Geckos, except day geckos, are an exception because they're active mostly at night. Lighting is unnecessary. If you grow living plants in the vivarium, however, you'll almost certainly need some form of cage lighting to keep them healthy. For many lizards, sunlight performs another important function. As we've already seen, these species aren't able to make their own vitamin D, so they can't absorb calcium from their diet. This leads to weak bones, deformities and other ailments. One way around the problem is to sprinkle vitamin D on their food, and we'll deal with this method when we move on to feeding later on. The other method, though, is to install special lights that give out ultraviolet light. These lights are called black lights and should be available through your reptile dealer. Black lights are fitted alongside normal fluorescent lights and should be switched on at the same time so that when the lizard basks, it'll absorb the ultraviolet. Because lizards are wild animals, even if they have been bred in captivity, it's not a good idea to handle them more than necessary. Otherwise, they may become stressed. There are times when you will have to pick up and hold your lizard though, such as when you clean its cage. You can sometimes persuade small lizards to climb onto your hand 
and as long as there's no risk that they'll jump off and run away, this is the best method for delicate ones that might be damaged by over-enthusiastic handling. You should grasp larger lizards gently but firmly behind their head and then lift them up at the same time, supporting their bodies with your other hand. Species with long tails, such as iguanas, sometimes thrash about if they're restrained and it's a good idea to get someone to help or, failing this, to tuck their tail under your arm. Remember to keep handling down to a minimum. Even if you want to tame your lizard, it'll be more comfortable if you allow it to approach you rather than have you chase it around its cage. So, to summarise, all lizards need background heating, which is best provided by a heat pad fixed under or inside one end of their cage. Many lizards also require additional heating in the form of spotlights or ceramic heaters to give them a hot spot in which they can bask. And many species also require extra ultraviolet light, which is most easily provided by using a black light. The amount of humidity that the various species need is related to the environment from which they come. Desert lizards obviously need a low humidity, whereas rainforest species need substantially more. You can raise the humidity by spraying the cage once or twice each day using a fine mister, such as the ones that gardeners use. Remember that wooden cages won't last long if you spray them frequently. It's easier to maintain humidity in the cage if there's not too much ventilation, but you should make sure that the atmosphere inside doesn't become stagnant. All lizards like fresh air, no matter where they come from. Finally, spraying is also important for a number of lizard species that don't seem to be able to drink from a water bowl. These include chameleons and anolis lizards. Feeding is another area that sometimes gives lizard keepers problems if they don't know enough about the species they're keeping. Lizards can be herbivorous or carnivorous. Herbivorous lizards eat a range of plant material, including leaves, fruit, vegetables and flowers. Carnivorous lizards eat a range of other animals, including insects, worms, eggs, small rodents and larger mammals. You must provide a varied diet for your lizard. If you only feed one type of food, say lettuce or crickets, the diet is likely to lack some essential ingredient. Remember that some large lizards regard small lizards as part of the menu. As a general rule, don't mix large and small lizards in the same cage. Herbivorous lizards, those that eat mostly plants, are the easiest to cater for. You can give them just about any fruit or vegetable that you can buy in a supermarket, as well as a number of things that you're unlikely to see for sale, such as weeds and wildflowers. Each meal should consist of a number of different foods, sliced and mixed together so that the lizard cannot easily pick out a few favourite items. Also, you should vary the mixture occasionally. Sprinkle each meal liberally with a good vitamin and mineral supplement. These are available from reptile suppliers and there are many different makes and formulae. Choose one that's high in calcium and contains vitamin D3. These are the most important ingredients. You should feed herbivorous lizards every day, although if you have to miss the odd day, they'll not come to any harm. Carnivorous lizards eat a range of prey, depending mostly on their size. Small species, such as anolis, eat small crickets, waxworm larvae, spiders and similar prey. Slightly larger ones, such as leopard geckos and many skinks, eat the same food but in larger sizes. You must provide a varied diet, giving them crickets day after day isn't good enough. This is a good point at which to look at some of the live foods that are usually available from pet suppliers. The most common and convenient ones are crickets, of which several species, light brown, dark brown and black, may be offered. Crickets are a good food because they're lively and quickly attract the attention of lizards. Some lizards show a preference for one kind of cricket over the others. You might have to experiment a little. Crickets are usually sold in small tubs in which they can only survive for a few days. If you want to keep them for longer than this, prepare a small pet cage by putting several pieces of crumpled newspaper in the bottom. Feed the crickets with pieces of biscuit, bran or rabbit food and spray them lightly every day so that they can drink. There are special foods that can be given to crickets before they're fed to the lizards. These increase their nutritional value 
and it's worth looking out for them, although they're probably not essential. Other food to be considered include mealworms, which are the larvae of a small beetle. Although they're widely used to feed birds, they're not so valuable for lizards, because their hard shell isn't easily digested. Lizards fed only on mealworms can quickly become deficient in calcium. Some lizards are especially fond of them, however, and so they can be used in small numbers to add variety to the diet. Larger lizards, such as bearded dragons, will eat the so-called giant mealworms, which are also available sometimes. They're so keen on them that they'll take them from your fingers, and this is a good way of taming them, but be careful not to give them too many. Mealworms and giant mealworms can be stored in a plastic box or small pet's cage with a shallow layer of bran or peat moss on the bottom. They don't need water and last quite well. Eventually they turn into pupae and then beetles. Some lizards will also eat these stages in their life cycle. Waxworms are the caterpillars of a small moth that inhabits beehives. Because they're soft-bodied, they're easily digested by lizards, which often prefer them to all other foods. They contain a large proportion of fat, and so they're especially good for lizards that are underweight. But be careful not to let the lizards become obese. Waxworms are usually sold in a small portion of the mixture that they eat and in which they live. Simply keep this in a cool place and pick out the waxworms as required. Using large numbers can be fiddly, but they're so popular with lizards that they're probably worth the extra trouble from time to time. They have one other disadvantage, they can climb up glass. So unless the cage has a good lid, some of them may escape into your house, turning up weeks later as small silvery grey moths. Other live foods include those that you catch yourself around the house or in the garden. Spiders, crane flies and other small creatures make good lizard food, although you'll probably only be able to catch enough of them to provide the occasional treat. Be very careful, however, to avoid collecting them in places that might have been sprayed with insecticides or weed killers, because most of these substances are lethal to lizards. Regardless of which live foods you use or where you obtain them, you should always sprinkle the lizard's food with a vitamin and mineral supplement, as with the herbivorous species. A good way of doing this is to put the required number of crickets, waxworms or whatever into a polythene bag containing about one teaspoonful of the vitamin powder. Grip the top of the bag and shake well before tipping them into the cage. Any vitamin powder left over will be used again for the next feed although you'll obviously have to top it up occasionally. Feed small carnivorous lizards every day, but larger ones will easily go for a day or two without food. The amount each lizard will eat varies, and you'll have to find this out by trial and error. If there are still insects left in the cage the following day, you're giving them too much food, but if they eat everything you give them immediately and are still active, they probably need more. Ideally, they should pounce on the food straight away and eat at least some of it, Otherwise, the insects will clean all the vitamin and mineral powder off their bodies and it won't reach the lizards. Also, leaving many crickets in the cage can be stressful for the lizards because they dislike insects crawling all over them. And if the lizards are breeding, it's especially important to make sure that there isn't a population of crickets living in the cage because they'll attack and destroy any eggs that the lizards may lay. Water must be available for lizards at all times. Use a shallow bowl and place it in a cool part of their cage. If you're using crickets as food, place a small stone or twig in the bowl so that if they jump in, they can climb back out. Otherwise, the water will turn to a smelly kind of soup with your expensive crickets as its main ingredient. If a lizard is healthy when you buy it and you give it the right conditions, then it's unlikely to become ill. But if you do have any problems, first make sure that your cage is properly set up and that the temperature, humidity and lighting are suitable for the species you keep. Then make sure that it's eating and that you're giving it the correct diet with all the necessary vitamins and minerals it might need. And remember, nine out of every ten problems are associated with a poor environment. Also, you should bear in mind that some small lizards are short-lived by nature, and if they've been collected in the wild, they may already be over the hill, so you shouldn't expect them to live forever. This is another good reason for buying captive bred babies. At least you'll know that most of their life is in front of them, not behind them.
Here are some of the health problems to look out for. Poor shedding. This can indicate that the lizard is sick, but is more likely to be the result of keeping it too dry. Spray one end of the cage lightly to make a small area that's permanently slightly damp, and the problem should cure itself. If a lizard has parts of its skin firmly stuck, put it into a small plastic box containing damp moss for a few hours, and the skin will usually come away. You may have to help by gently pulling away some of it, especially on the lizard's toes. Blocked nostrils, sometimes accompanied by mucus in the mouth, can be a sign of respiratory disease. You may need the help of a vet, but sometimes simply raising the temperature by 5 or 10 degrees will cure this problem. Wounds. These may be the result of fighting, especially between two males. The only answer is to separate them permanently. Large wild-caught lizards often panic in small cages and bash their snouts. If they continue to do this, it can eventually lead to an infected wound and permanent mutilation. Give them a bigger cage and more seclusion. Better still, avoid the species that are prone to this behaviour. Wild water dragons, basilisks are examples of species where this problem often arises. Females sometimes get injuries to their necks, caused by the male during the breeding season. These usually heal of their own accord, but if the male is very persistent, it might be advisable to separate them for a while. As we said at the beginning of the video, there are thousands of different types of lizard, and even though only a few can be successfully kept, you still have an enormous selection to choose from. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the video and what we've been able to tell you about lizards. If you follow all the advice, you can expect many highly rewarding and successful years of keeping lizards.